in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The labor of all church workers shall never be in vain as our Father, the Father of all globally, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui gives us the Global Church Workers Conference live from Taraba State, Nigeria. All church workers and ministers globally to join hands with all ministers across Taraba State, Northern Nigeria from 17 to 20 November 2022. It's our time for triumphing in ministry, even in troublous times. Pastor Dr. W. F. Kubuhi will be ministering 8 a.m. daily from Jalingo, Taraba State, to the world, brass satellites, and on all our social media platforms. It will be an avalanche of global expositions and revelations. Your labor will not be in vain. When we started the year 2022, you had hopes, you had desires, you had dreams, but suddenly, all over the globe, we read and hear of failures economically, politically, with climate change and security breaches here and there. And now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Today, the Lord is saying, weep not. All your tears are dried, because behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed. And it's confirmed that there's still one hope, one way, one solution, and one power that never fails. The power of Jesus Christ reverberates this November with GCK live from Adamawa State, Nigeria. The land of beauty set to beautify your life through Christ. As the covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui will touch down in Adamawa, Nigeria with the power that never fails. Healing, deliverance, salvation. November 24 to 29, 2022. 1600 hours GMT daily and 0700 hours GMT for Sunday worship service. Young people from all levels will be empowered for excellence at the Impact Academy on November 26, 2022 at 0600 hours GMT. Ministers and professionals will be empowered for breakthrough in ministry on November 25, 26, 28 and 29 at 0600 hours GMT. Our guest gospel minister is Bob Feets. This is an avalanche of manifestation of the power that never fails for all life. Power will herald your celebration. Dr. William Kumui says, Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. GCK, the gospel to every creature. In Jesus' name, we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for what we're hearing and what we're seeing. Thank you for your ministers that we've been using to bless our lives. We're praying, O oh Lord, that as you lead us and as we continue hearing all these messages, that our lives, as well as our campuses, will be transformed in Jesus' name. You are just 120 of your disciples in the upper room. The power came on them. Their lives were literally transformed. And then with those 120 committed, consecrated people, empowered by your spirit, 
you turned their world upside down. And you made such a change in their community and society that the world has never been the same as a result of their lives, the result of their ministry. We're more than 120 here. And we believe that if we can so surrender ourselves to the Lord and become so consecrated, so committed, there is no limit to what you can do to every one of our lives. And therefore, Lord, this morning we come and we lay everything before you. We are praying, O oh Lord, you'll take everything within us so that you'll touch, you'll transform, you'll purify, you will sanctify, and then you'll equip us in a mighty way so we can be useful in your kingdom at such a time like this in Jesus' name. We know there are so many needs on our campuses. And we know that the spiritual challenge is very great. And the work to be done cannot be done by people who do not know their God. People who are not fully submitted, fully yielded, fully surrendered unto you. Therefore, Lord, we pray that this morning, none of us will hold anything back from you in Jesus' name. But that will surrender everything we need to surrender and will get the experience we need to get from you so that we'll become mighty instruments in your hands. Do it for us, Lord. And do something for our communities through us as well. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are grateful to the Lord for all that has been going on from the beginning of this conference. And the message we have now is a message that is very important. Generally, when we handle messages on consecration, we have limited understanding of consecration. And we have limited understanding of the necessity of consecration in our lives so that we can be all that God wants us to be. But actually, the subject of consecration is so broad and is so deep that a sincere Christian that really wants to serve the Lord and he wants to make an impact in his community at the present time as well as in the future. This is a message such a Christian cannot afford to overlook. Although we have titled this message Consecration for Sanctification, but really, when you talk about consecration, you're not only talking about consecration only to get sanctified. To maintain that sanctification, you need consecration. And to maintain usefulness in the kingdom of God, you need consecration. To be able to grow in your spiritual life, you need consecration. And for God to be able to reveal and expose himself to you, like he does to no other ordinary Christian, you need consecration for you to be able to do something that has an indelible mark in your community for the Lord and for the kingdom. You need consecration for you to enjoy the Lord, enjoy your Christian life. You need consecration and also for you to be able to live out such a beautiful Christian life that others without you even having to preach or speak much, will be turning to the Lord through you. You'll need consecration. Perhaps because we use the word consecration, 
Many of us may not know what consecration really is. Maybe if we use some other words synonymous with consecration or giving us some other areas or shades of meaning related to consecration, we might understand better. As we talk about consecration, we're talking about devotion. When you are devoted to someone, or you are devoted to something, and the devotion is so much that people around you can see, that will be the same as consecration. Or perhaps we might refer to it as dedication. There may be a cause that you are dedicated to. There may be an individual you are dedicated to. There might be, it may be that you are dedicated to God. Permit me please to use this illustration. You will find that there are idol worshippers that dedicate an animal to an idol. And they know that that idol in their own concept and superstition has total claim on that animal. If when you are so dedicated to God, that God has a total claim upon your life, that whatever he says, wherever he directs, that's exactly what you are going to do. That dedication to God will refer to as consecration. We might also refer to it as sacrifice. You will find in your own young life that sometimes you want something so much that you look at your life and you say, I want this so much. It may be that you want to follow a, a particular course of study. It may be that you want to change your course. And the discipline you now want to follow, you want it so much that you sacrifice the years you have given to some other areas of study. So, there are times we refer to consecration as sacrifice. And the things you are sacrificing are not necessarily sinful. They might be things that are proper and legitimate and right for you to have. But because of a greater desire, because of a greater ambition, because of a consuming kind of passion, you sacrifice that legitimate thing so that you can achieve what you are passionately desiring. That sacrifice is consecration. Or simply, we might just refer to it as self-denial. And there are things that are not necessarily sinful that you deny yourself of. And it is as a result of this denial, you are able to discipline yourself, control yourself. You have a mastery of yourself so that you'll be able to achieve what you are looking for to achieve. That self-denial is the same as consecration. In Christian language, we might also refer to consecration as absolute surrender. In contradistinction to partial surrender this is not just the initial surrender that a person has and it says i surrendered my life to jesus christ sometimes we use that word surrender in such a glib casual way that we do not really realize what we're saying but there comes a time in your life when you come to the altar or you come to your own gethsemane like the Lord Jesus Christ, and you become completely, absolutely, continually, forever surrendered unto the Lord. Or it may be, we refer to this consecration as submission to God's revealed will. Submission to God's revealed will. Now, all these other things I have mentioned, they appear positive in a way we, we can also refer to consecration as the destruction 
of the dearest idols. The idols are referred to are not the idols of the illiterate, crude idol worshipper, worshipping stone and wood and pot and material things. I refer to the idols that are so dear to the heart that to pull that thing away from you, to tear that thing away from you, to get rid of that thing away in, in, in your life, is like tearing a part of your flesh away. The thing is so close, but it is standing between you and the Almighty God, and it is hindering your worship and your devotion unto the Lord. And then you come to the Lord and you say, These things are so dear. The idol may be an ideology. The idol may be a particular principle in your life that you are a strong-willed individual. If I say this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to do. And you are taking a particular decision in the past. And that decision is like it's coming between you and God. That decision is like it's hindering your service in the Lord. And you are, you, are, you are so made up your mind that I know I'm a strong-willed individual. Before I make my decision, I think I can parley, I can talk with people. But then once I make my decision, then it's made, that is it. That they may become an idol. The ideology, the principle, the things you are holding on to that stand between you and the Lord that stand between you and humility and bending and yielding and surrendering to the Lord. You come at the time of consecration. You present everything to the Lord for destruction. Now you will find consecration in this way relating to devotion, dedication, sacrifice, self-denial, absolute surrender submission to god's revealed will and the destruction of the dearest idols they are very essential to our relationship with god in psalm 50 psalm 50 verse 5 gather my saints together unto me those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice there is a fellowship of saints that is not open to every dick and hurry there is a fellowship of children of god specially selected specially favored specially loved children of god that is not open to everyone that calls himself a believer there is an inner circle in the mind of God, in the presence of God, in fellowship and relationship with God that is not open to everyone that calls himself a Christian. You find that in the life of Jesus Christ. That there were people in the inner circle so close to him, leaning upon him, asking him some questions, knowing the very depth of the mind of God that God had given to him, there is a kind of inner circle that people on the edge never got into. And when you look at the list of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find them in groups. We don't have time to look into that now. You will find the first four are always the first four. Read it in Matthew. And read it in Mark, read it in Luke, or in John, or in Acts of the Apostles, you will find that among the twelve, you always have the first four as that group, that inner circle, very close to the Lord, knowing the very might of God. Even among those four, you will find the three that, that is, you remove Andrew, and then you have the other three, Peter, James, and John. And you will find that there were things they knew. There were places they went. There were things that God revealed unto them that he never revealed unto the middle four. When you take the whole list, look at the middle four. You will find as you look at all the list, the middle four, they may be rearranged, but they are always the middle four. 
the first four always the first four and then the last four always the last four and of course you know that judas Iscariot was always on the edge he was always the last one to be mentioned in all the least now it says in this verse 5 gather my saints together unto me you, you can see the possessive uh, pronoun it says they are mine gather them unto me and it says who are those people these are the ones who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice a covenant with me by a special kind of dedication these are the people that come into the inner circle i need to discuss with them i need to give them the plan of the kingdom i need to send them to their generation i need to do something with them and for them that i cannot do for the ordinary fellow gather them unto me you see the importance the benefit the essence of consecration in some one one age psalm 1 1 8 and in verse 27 psalm 1 1 8 verse 27 god is the lord which has showed us light bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar there are times that there are people that make excuses and they will say really i had sacrificed that thing to the lord until another thought came until some other ideas came until my mind was telling me that maybe i'm being fanatical until something was saying maybe i am going too far until something was saying maybe this level of consecration or commitment or sacrifice is not required of a young person like myself and so the inspired psalmist says when you bring your sacrifice to the lord if you are of the seed of abraham the devil is going to challenge that sacrifice and it's going to send enough birds of prey to take the sacrifice away from the altar. It's going to send enough beasts of burden to be able to distract your attention and to take or to devour the sacrifice from the altar. Therefore, what you will do if you really want to consecrate to the Lord is bring this thing to the Lord and then bind that sacrifice with cords upon the altar. Now we understand in the case of Abraham, when he divided the animals, the birds, and everything, and then he was watching over it to make sure that these had been presented unto the Lord. If I brought something like that to the Lord, then I could maybe take a rope and then tie it upon the wooden altar. But the consecration we're talking about is not the bringing of an animal like that. Neither is it the consecration of bringing a sheet of paper and then putting it on the table and saying that sheet of paper, oh Lord, is for you. And then we think the wind might blow it away. And therefore God might not find that sheet of paper to use. And therefore I take maybe some twine and then I tie it up so that the wind cannot blow it away. If it were a physical thing, then I can take rope or twine or whatever and then tie it on the wooden altar. But it's not a physical thing. It's not a material thing that is tangible that I can touch. My very heart. My very life my future everything i ever desire in my life my past my present my future my capabilities my skill my talent everything i may ever possess in my life they may not be things i can quantify but they may be things that are so deep and so serious and so precious that other people are holding on to and i want to give it unto the lord how do i bind that upon the hands of the altar i bind it by the daily vows i make 
I go to the Lord every day and I say, Lord, when I gave my life to you and I became born again, I told you at that time, I do not want anything but you. All I want in my life is to please my God. And then the cord with which I bind my sacrifice, my consecration on the altar is the vow, the daily vow I make every quiet time. Then you tell the Lord, O oh Lord, temptations are coming, difficulties are coming, the persecution is there, I've been facing some disappointments, and these temptations and disappointments and conflicts and persecution, they're trying to tell me to withdraw a little from the Lord and to withdraw some of the things I laid on the altar before. O oh Lord, with the court of daily vow, I now vow again. I recommit myself again. And I tell you, Lord, I'm not going to take anything away from this altar except adding to all that I've given unto you in the past. In so doing, with those daily vows I am making to the Lord, I am binding my sacrifice with cords even upon the horns of the altar. But then, as we talk about consecration, is each everybody that can consecrate. Sometimes you'll we'll hear people just carelessly say, everyone must consecrate. And whenever we're not looking in depth into the word consecration, we might even say, the sinner can consecrate, the believer can consecrate. Well, if we talk in general terms, perhaps so. But if we talk in specific terms, and we really come to talk about consecration, we need then to understand that, number one, there is unacceptable consecration before God. We need to know that. There is unacceptable consecration before God. That is going to be a point one. Number two, salvation and consecration to God. Actually, consecration begins at the point of yielding your life, yielding your heart, yielding all you are, all you hope to be unto the Lord, to be born again. And then consecration continues. And actually, consecration never stops. When you are sanctified, before you are sanctified, you have to be consecrated. And at the time you have been sanctified, even after the sanctification, consecration has to continue. Because, you know, every new day in your life has to be consecrated to God. Every new opportunity in your life has, be has to be consecrated to God. Every new discovery in your life, every new discovery of talent, of skill, of opportunity, of privilege in life has to be consecrated unto God. Originally, maybe at the time of your sanctification, you had made a blanket kind of consecration. You have said, oh Lord, all I will ever be, all I will ever achieve, I consecrate everything to you. Well, that's so that's so general but then every new day with every new opportunity with every new privilege with every new challenge that comes to your life when it is given to you you give it back to the lord in fact even some small small things let's say for example you've done something marvelous something great something so good and beautiful and the people are praising you. And they're saying, ah, oh, brother, so and so, sister, so and so, look at this magnificent, wonderful thing that he has done. Look at this message he has delivered. Immediately they give you that praise. You consecrate that praise unto the Lord. Not unto me, O God, but it is unto thy name. You see, every new thing you have, when you really understand what we call consecration, Every new thing, every good thing that comes to your life, it doesn't terminate with you. It doesn't stop with you. You offer each unto the Lord. So then point number two, salvation and consecration to God. Number three, consecration, faith, and sanctification. Consecration, faith, 
and sanctification. Let's go to number one. Unacceptable consecration unto God. You see, there is the attitude behind the consecration. There is the life behind the consecration. There is the relationship behind the consecration. If the relationship is not there to back it up, if the proper attitude is not there to back it up, if the proper disposition is not there to back it up, if the faithfulness is not there to back it up, if the teachable spirit is not there to back it up, if the humility is not there to back it up, that consecration is unacceptable in the sight of God. Before then you think about consecration, you are thinking about what relationship do I have with God? Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Says the Lord, I am full of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks and of lambs or of goats. The children of Israel came to the point in their lives as well as in their worship where they thought, see what Moses had given us as commandment that we are to sacrifice this ram to the Lord in the day of atonement. And they thought it was just to be a mechanical thing. Their heart was not there. There was no spiritual relationship backing it up. They didn't bring it with such a submissive spirit, appreciating the Almighty God, knowing they are nothing and God is everything. They brought it as He wants it, here is it. And therefore, God said, The relationship is not there. There's no respect for my commandments. And you are not living the way you ought to live. You put all my commandments behind you, and then you bring multitude of sacrifices. They are not acceptable. Then he says in verse 12, When ye come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? Forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Okay. If it is that I must not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, if it is going, I will go. If it is showing up and saying, Oh God, I am present. I never meet church service. I never miss a Sabbath ceremony. If it is just to be there, I'll be there. The relationship wasn't there. The attitude, the right disposition, the life wasn't there. And therefore God said, Even when you come to appear before me, you think that's what I want? Just treading my couch? Just... Um, being in the place, warming the bench, you think that's what I want? It wasn't acceptable to the Lord in verse 13, bring no more vain oblations, incenses, abomination unto me. Remember that in their own worship in the Old Testament, those priests and high priests were allowed, in fact commanded, to offer the incense unto the Lord. But even in their own context, the Lord was telling them, even the things are required, and the things you are doing, they are abominations unto me. He said, the new moons, and the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with, it is iniquity, even your solemn feast. What did he say all this? Verse 15. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. You see that? Your life, your relationship with the Lord, the heart and attitude with which you say you are consecrating what you are consecrating, that makes it either acceptable or unacceptable in the sight of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 18. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a war, of an harlot, of an adulteress, 
of a fornicator. You will not bring the price, the higher, the game of high lottery, of unclean living unto the Lord, or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both these are abomination unto the Lord your God. The children of Israel needed to be enlightened and educated. That if somebody was living an unclean life, that all such people may say they are bringing to the Lord, they are not acceptable. If, for example, you are living in sin, if, for example, you are living in adultery, in fornication, immorality, and then the money that the people that you are committing the sin with that they give unto you as the price of harlotry, as the hire of a wall that has been given unto you. If you said, well, I'm consecrating all my finance, all my resources, all I have, I'm consecrating it to the Lord because we have a major project and uh, they have made announcement about it and this is my consecration. It's not acceptable before the Lord. So the relationship is number one in Psalm 50 from verse 16. Psalm 50 from verse 16. But unto the wicked, God says, What hast thou to declare my statutes, and that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee? There have been times that there are people that will cast the word of the Lord behind them. And yet, these people will be acting religious. They might even say they are evangelical. Or they might use the word charismatic. Or they might use the word Pentecostal. Whatever branch of Christianity they might claim. If they are rejecting the word of the Lord. If, for example, they say, I don't want to hear anything about that kind of thing restitution. And I don't want to hear about uh, living and overcoming life above sin. All I know is that let those uh, other Christians who believe sanctification and holiness, let them live the way they want to live. This is the way I am going to live. But I am going to be consecrated, committed unto God. I am going to be as dedicated to God as those other holiness people. It's impossible. God is not even going to accept anything from you if you are casting behind you the word of the Lord. Didn't you see it where we read it? Seeing, verse 17, thou hatest instruction. You hate the word of God. You hate the doctrines of the Bible. And casteth my words behind thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou contestest, thou consentest with him. And hast been partaker with adulterers. If you are befriending adulterers, lecturers. If you are still in evil with lecturers, and then you are saying, well, but I'm a Christian, but being a student, if you don't do these things they are asking, and if you don't go into this unlawful, immoral, unclean relationship, uh, you know what it means. And you know that uh, these uh, lecturers are so evil, and they are so bent in their way, that if you want to take any paper out of this uh, institution, uh, you really have to bend a little. If you are bending like that a little, it means that you are not really devoted to the word of the Lord. And the Lord is saying there is no consecration you make that is going to be acceptable. Verse, eight, verse 19. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence, and thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. You see, there are people that will gossip 
from morning till evening criticize and slander and uh, detail bearing from morning till evening when we talk about consecration oh they say praise the lord i'm consecrating my life i'm consecrating yielding everything i have unto the lord you think what well, the gossiping and backbiting and the slandering and a cutting down of your neighbors of your fellow brothers and sisters you think consecration is acceptable to god no your life falls your relationship with the lord first it is out of that relationship you are giving to the lord that then you'll be able to consecrate unto the lord in osea chapter 8 osea chapter 8 from verse 11 verse 12 and verse 13 Osea H11 Because a frame has made many altars to sin, altars shall be unto him to sin. Skip verse 12 for a moment and come to 13. The sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it. But the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt. These were people that were delivered out of Egypt. And these were people that claimed to be the people of God. And yet in their attempt to worship the Lord, they were making altars. But their altars became sin. There are people that will say they have a form of worship. And their worship eventually becomes sinful in the sight of God. It may be that it starts with what they call praise worship. The name looks alright. But eventually, the drumming, the dancing, and the holding of hands, and everything comes in. And you find a lot of immorality coming in as a result of what they are calling praise worship. In the making of the altars, altars became sin even for them. And then it says in verse 13, they were still sacrificing. And they were still trying to say that it was the offering of the Lord. And yet God said he did not accept the offering they were making. Now look at verse 12. Verse 12 is the pivotal point. Is the real reason why God said he did not accept their sacrifices. He said, I have written to him the great things of my law. But they were counted as a strange thing. God spoke to these people and he gave them the great things of his law. The things he counted essential. He counted important. He counted indispensable. And he joyfully gave it to these children of Israel. And they counted it as a strange thing. You know there are people that count the doctrines of the Bible. The lifestyle of the believer. And the things required by the Lord. They count all those things as strange. And they say, who can practice that today? That is for the Victorian age. That is for the middle uh, kind of ages. The dark ages. When those medieval people were practicing. The, uh, we, we cannot go back to uh, that kind of thing. We cannot read everything in the Bible. And follow everything in the Bible. They said this is modern times. And because of that kind of concept. They throw the essence of the word of God. The doctrines of the Bible. They throw everything away. And yet they are talking about consecration. And they are talking about sacrifices. And they are talking about being dedicated and devoted to the Lord. I have written unto them. Imagine God talking about the children of Israel. I have written unto him the great things of my Lord. The things that are weighty in my mind. The weightier matters of the Lord. What's their attitude? What's their response? How did he accept the things of the Lord? Those things were counted as a strange thing. And at times, for example, the other night, I spoke about the dressing of the believer. And although I didn't have time to go in depth into it, but I made some explanations. It might be that there will be, there will be people that will say, ah, uh, in this modern world, that is strange. Not using jewelry. 
not having all those lipsticks, not having the perming, and not wearing the slacks uh, for the ladies, and all these uh, young men that are now putting holes in their ears and putting earrings, not doing all that, not having this kind of air do that the uh, boys or the young men are having now, and they say, ah, it's all that included in the Christian life, they count it as a strange thing. And even though they count the word of God as a strange thing, they might still go ahead to say that they want to sacrifice, they want to dedicate, they want to consecrate, and they want to surrender. What else are you surrendering when your life is so dirty? If you're going to surrender to the Lord, if you're going to consecrate to the Lord, you have to come to the right relationship to start with. It is when you come to the Lord at the point of salvation. And you offer yourself to the Lord, repenting of sin, wanting to believe on the Lord, so that the blood of Jesus will wash you and cleanse you. You become born again, you become saved, then consecration becomes meaningful. That then leads us to point two. Salvation and consecration to God. Salvation and consecration to God. Now, this is not either or it is both and what i mean by that is this is not either salvation or consecration there's nothing like that it is both salvation and consecration there are some people that are asking the question they're saying can a person be saved and not really consecrated to god can a person be born again and really is not a, a, we will say, is not a committed Christian? The Bible doesn't know anything like that. In the modern books that people are writing about the Christian life, they have a lot of uh, titles they give. They say, well, this is a Christian, but he's not a committed Christian. You know what Jesus said? Except you forsake all things, you cannot be my disciple. If you, are, if you are a disciple at all, if you are a child of God at all, if you are born again at all, you are all together a Christian. You are committed unto the Lord. It is salvation and consecration. It is not that you have a choice whether to be consecrated or not to be consecrated. If heaven is your goal, if pleasing the Lord is your goal, if holiness is your goal, if you really want to be useful to the Lord, if you want to be counted as one of the people of God, it is not an optional thing. Consecration is a part of your Christian living. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, from verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, what makes a person a brother or a sister? What makes you a part of the brethren? What makes you a part of the brethren is that you have realized you are a sinner. And you are not playing with, you are not joking with the realization of being a sinner. And you came to the Lord. Why did you come to the Lord? Because you knew that you couldn't save yourself. And religion couldn't save you. And all your devotion apart from Christ could not save you. And all the religion and all the practices and the water baptism and the confirmation or whatever it is you have done in your denomination could not save you. That Christ and Christ alone must save. Therefore you came to the Lord. And when you came to the Lord, I suppose if you were, if you were really saved, you were not laughing you see, there are people today, uh, we, we make the message of salvation so casual. And we say, well, you know, the Lord wants to receive everyone. Everyone. Everyone that repents. You have to qualify that. Everyone that is sincere. Everyone that really wants to follow the Lord. Everyone that wants to take the yoke of Christ upon him or upon her. The Lord wants to receive everyone they say. Therefore, they say, come just as you are. I hope you qualify that. You come just as you are so that God can touch your life and transform your life and change your life so that you do not remain as you were. Because if any man be in Christ, it's a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. So when we tell the people, come just as you are, we don't stop there. And then, the, you know, some of the evangelists will tell the people, and some of the people that come to our campuses will tell the people, there is nothing you do. 
Christ has done everything. All you need to do now is to accept Christ. That's not complete. You're accepting Christ and his word. You're accepting Christ and his lifestyle. You're accepting Christ and all that he lays down for us in the word of God. He said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, if you do that, I will be with you till the end of the world. Therefore, it is not just accepting Christ. He that rejects my word, rejects me. And he that rejects me, rejects him that has sent me. You are, you are accepting Christ and his word. You are accepting Christ and his way. You are accepting Christ and the lifestyle of the believer. You see, there are many people that make the salvation message so unscriptural, so incomplete, that when the people come, they say they come to Christ, they're still smoking, they're still in drugs, and they still have all these occultic practices, and they're still fighting, and they're still continuing with girlfriend, boyfriend, they still continue reading their pornographic literature and they're still doing a lot of evil things that you will know that if they really knew christ in any way at all they shouldn't have been doing those things and so it says i beseech you therefore <laughs> brethren brethren the people that have realized they were sinners then they came to christ in repentance and there is a real change of life and change of heart and then it says that by the mercies of God. How did you get saved? By the grace of God. By the mercy of God. Because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Then you became born again. It says now that you present your bodies. A living sacrifice. That is the consecration we are talking about. After you have given your life to the Lord. After you have become born again. Then you now voluntarily present something unto god and the bible is very clear and uh, there is no difficult vocabulary here there is nothing here that even needs any explanation except that many people read this so casually and they do not understand and they do not try to understand what they're reading it says to present your bodies a living sacrifice unto god are there not people that tell us that Christianity has nothing to do with your body? Christianity has nothing to do with what you wear, what you eat, what you put in, whether you are smoking or not smoking, whether you are drinking or not drinking, whether you are like Jezebel or not. That Christianity has nothing to do with that. That, when, that these people that talk about consecration and sacrifice and devotion and surrender and yieldedness, they say they have missed the point. They have made Christianity external. Is it the preacher here that makes Christianity external? Or the Lord himself that said you present your body unto God. A living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto god it's not just talking of keeping your heart holy it's also talking of keeping your body holy and uh, when i when i still had more time than i have now and i used to be uh, be invited to campuses i would see sometimes before the meeting that the young uh, men and the young women, they will be holding one another, pushing one another, patting one another at the back, and then maybe sometimes even embracing one another. And uh, the young man might take the scarf of the lady and then tie it uh, around his neck, and they were evangelicals. And then we'll get into the meeting. And as we get into the meeting, I'll be surprised that these people that were doing all those careless, unclean, and sinful things, they'll be the people to come and start leading choruses. And, and those people could sing. If you talk of singing, and you know, they will, uh, they will mobile, motivate the people and tell them, praise the Lord, raise up your hand, and say quite a lot of things. And then they begin to act as if they were angels and the uh, greatest worshippers in the world. And then whenever the word of God came unto them, I've been on campuses where the word of God will come to them and some of them will openly 
rebel against the word of God. Of course, I knew that if I had to be a John the Baptist and lay it upon them, I still had to do that. And yet, they reject the word of God. And they will say, God has nothing to do with your body. But doesn't the Bible say that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. If your Christianity doesn't touch your body, doesn't touch your dressing, doesn't touch your language, doesn't touch what you eat, your Christianity doesn't affect what you drink, there is no Christianity there, let us be sincere. It says that if you are a child of God, here is what you come to lay upon the altar. It says your body as a living sacrifice and this is acceptable unto God and it is your reasonable service. In fact, it tells us, it even begins to tell us what to do with members of our body. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6 from verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey each in the lost thereof. Your body. Let not sin affect your body. Don't let your any part of your body be habitually used to living in something that is not right. Cut it off. Destroy it. Be ruthless with it and say, I'm going to serve the Lord. This is what it means to serve the Lord. That your hand, your mouth, your ears, your brain, your body, every part of you is totally consecrated unto the Lord. The body is not for sin. It is not for evil. If you say you are born again, if you say you are a child of God, then everything you do with every member of your body, we can write about it and you can see the light of day. But if there is anything you are doing behind a curtain, we may not want to mention those things uh, because of the use of language. If there is anything you are doing behind a curtain or at the bathroom, on your bed, or all alone by yourself, that is so clean that you will not want us to speak about and attach your name with publicly, then you are not really fully living the Christian life. If you are living the Christian life, it means that you are going to yield all the members of your body unto righteousness. Look at verse 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Neither yield the members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. When we are born again, we are going to live clear, distinct Christian lives. In First Peter chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2, verse 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Can I comment on that word sacrifice for some time? You see, many Christians nowadays, they do not realize that Christianity is going to inconvenience you. Or they want a Christianity of convenience. They want a kind of religion of convenience. Something that doesn't demand anything from them. They want a kind of Christianity that will not be inconvenient, that will have this uh, uh, kind of uh, laxity, that will not school them and discipline them and control them. A kind of Christianity that you still have it and you do as you please. That's why they stray up to the false doctrine of eternal security. They think that once you said you gave your life to the Lord, you raised up your hand in a meeting. Now for the rest of your life, you can do as you please. You don't have to please the Lord. You don't have to inconvenience yourself at all. If you are going to sacrifice, it's going to demand some inconveniences. It's not going to be easy. Others are going to abuse you. When I was uh, in school like you, oh, there were inconveniences. 
all my classmates and you know they will talk about it even some of the lecturers they will talk very very negative and they will talk directly they will leave all the blessings and everything we're trying to do and they'll be talking about religion just to change my mind and even in my secondary school i got used to that because i attended a secondary school where it was brainwashing and he tried to make every one of us not to believe in God. And if we carried Bible, if we did anything in the morning assembly, they will come to the assembly and talk about it for minutes just to brainwash us. It was like we were in the communist country, even though I was here in Nigeria. And yet, I knew it was going to be inconvenient. It was going to ostracize me. And it was going to cut a lot of people away from me. But I knew that this was the way to worship the Lord. Except you are doing that. Except you are ready to offer unto the Lord sacrifice. Something that inconveniences you. Something that puts you in a special class by yourself. That you are not going to go with the uh, ordinary people. The people that are just reading the Bible without understanding the meaning of what they read. Except you are going to do that. You cannot really consecrate yourself. You cannot really be a person that is totally fully following the Lord. It says in uh, verse 9. But here a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. And holy nation. A peculiar people. Pick up that word peculiar. If we were to ask ourselves one by one, do the students on your campuses or the workers around you, do they see you as peculiar? Do they see you as different? Do they use words like fanatics when they think about you? Do they feel that you are going too far? Do the ordinary churchgoers, do they see that you are so different from them that you are peculiar? If they have not seen that, I'm going to challenge your testimony to be a Christian. If you say you are a Christian, here is what the Bible tells us. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. What are these peculiar people to do? That ye might show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, this is consecration. It means that you are willing to lay everything on the line. You are willing to lay everything on the altar. You are willing to surrender everything absolutely and completely unto the Lord. Remember the foundation is being born again. After you are born again, it's like you are a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. And like the soldiers in this world are so consecrated as to forsake the civilian life as to forsake the conveniences of the normal life and to so dedicate themselves to the good of their nation or the protection of the territory of their nation that they know it might even cost them their lives that's consecration it is in the same way you as a soldier of christ you are coming to the kingdom of God. You are offering everything you have, everything you are, everything you hope to be, totally unto the Lord. Not minding the inconveniences or the suffering that might come upon you as a result of that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, from verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. If Christ has died for us, then all in Christ are dead. What does that mean? It means that now, if you're a real child of God, you are born again, and you are fully consecrated to God, then you are dead. Now, you know that when somebody is dead, if you slap him, if you push him, if you talk against him, if you criticize him, he doesn't even hear. And he doesn't, uh, he doesn't get up and say, be careful. Were it not for the fact that I was dead, you would have seen yourself. But be careful. Don't think I'm not hearing. But I'm dead. You see, a person like that is not really dead. The same thing in the Christian life. You are dead to all their criticisms. 
you are dead to all their negative comments about you it doesn't affect you you are dead to you are living in the same hostel with all these other ladies and these uh, ladies are bringing in maybe on saturday afternoon or any of the evenings they bring in all these boys and they see together they talk it doesn't even affect you at all because you know that you have laid that on the altar voluntarily you are giving that unto the lord or it is that uh, you you get to somebody's room and you get to his table and then he puts uh, maybe a photograph there of himself and a particular useless girl there and every time time uh, you come he's uh, trying to show you that uh, did you see this i came to your room and the whole thing is so bare only textbooks on the table no photographs nothing at all are you a human being are you biologically complete it doesn't move you at all you are not concerned about all those things because you know you are peculiar because you know you are different you are not like one of them if they want to get married at 18 that's their business that doesn't affect you or if uh, they do not want to continue their education and maybe at 2021 20, they already want to have three children that's uh, their business you are not comparing yourself with them because you are dead to all those things that they are doing and of course all the way they are spending money all those uh, ladies uh, in the hostels that are students and they are spending money like uh, they are already working you know they are getting the money but that doesn't affect you at all because you are dead unto all those things as a person consecrated devoted yielded surrendered unto the lord in verse 15 that he that he died for all that they which live should not live henceforth unto themselves should not leave his path unto themselves that's the consecration we're talking about that the life i now live it is not i that liveth but christ that liveth in me and that the life i now live i live by the faith of the son of god who lost me and he died for me you are not living by the power of the lord henceforth you are not living unto yourselves it is not what i want but what he wants it is not what i delight in what i enjoy it is not what is convenient for me but what he wants me to do that's what we call consecration and it says but unto unto him which died for them and rose again in um, philippians chapter 3 philippians chapter 3 verses 7 and 8 but what things were gained to me those i counted laws for christ the things that i delighted in the things that i enjoyed the theater that i'll go maybe every weekend or the film show that i'll try to go and view maybe every weekend and the dancing and the things that you'll try to go and do maybe every weekend or the things you made yourself available to do all the preoccupation with indoor games or outdoor games whatever it is all those things you have laid upon the altar the things which were gained unto me all those things now i count for loss for christ it says in verse 88 doubtless and i count all things i count all things but laws for the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus my lord i count all things laws for the excellency of the knowledge of christ jesus my lord when you really know the lord and the knowledge of the lord consumes you let me even use the word intoxicates you and you're almost like they told paul the apostle you are beside yourself much learning much religion has made you mad when religion i mean the kind in the bible the word of god and your commitment to the lord is the number one thing the primary thing in your life when it intoxicates you saturates you and fills you all those other things that uh, some so-called christians are involved with they don't matter to you anymore you are so committed to the lord it is the knowledge of the lord you are after all the time you'll be like the mary that has chosen one needful thing which shall not be taken away from her and it says it's for whom i have suffered the loss of all things and do condemn but don't that i may win christ 
It's the consecration that the Lord is requiring from you and from me. In uh, Second Corinthians chapter 8. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 5. And this they did. Not as we hoped. But first gave their own selves to the Lord. And unto us by the will of God. I want you to try to understand this verse because although it is very simple, you might miss the real meaning and the significance of the verse because of its simplicity. I want you to realize this Paul the Apostle writing here. And if you have been a student of the Bible, if you have read the epistles of Paul the Apostle, you will know that they are really weighty epistles. And you will know that he never played with the principles of the Christian life. And he expected that the people would live a very high level of Christian lives. And yet, you'll find that many, many people, they live below that standard. It's just like if you listen to the messages we're preaching like this message of today and maybe some other messages, you will say, well, maybe if I don't get to that level, if I even get near that level, I think it will be all right for me because, you know, this is so high, this is so straight, and this is so narrow that really this is going to take something from me if I am going to do it. That's how many of the people were. But then these people that Paul the Apostle wrote to, he said, not as we hoped. We even thought that if you reached the level where we were talking to you, you would have been wonderful Christians. You would have been matured Christians. You would have been people who would say, this is wonderful. This is unexpected. You have gone beyond the majority of the Christians around you. But Paul the Apostle said, you even did much more than we expected. Can you imagine some Christians going beyond what Paul would have said? Can you imagine some Christians living such a life, sacrificing so much, consecrating so much, that even Paul the Apostle will express a surprise that you have gone beyond what we expected that you will do. And so he said, you gave yourself to the Lord. And the word gave there that you, not as well, but you first gave. It's real abandonment. You abandoned yourself. You surrendered yourself. You said, oh Lord, here is, here is uh, all I have. And here is who I am. Do with me as it pleases you. Not only that, you also gave yourself unto us. But young people, please see what follows by the will of God. Doesn't mean you lady that you'll give yourself to the campus coordinator. And then we'll read the Bible and say, you see, these uh, believers, they didn't care for, you know, what happened to them. They gave themselves unto these apostles. And as the coordinator on this campus, I am the leader, the apostle here. Therefore, you lady, don't mind whatever I do with your body. After all, your own is consecration. You just give yourself. Uh-uh. You gave yourself unto us by the will of God not outside the will of God not outside the word of God the consecration we are talking about doesn't go into immorality doesn't go into uncleanness doesn't go into any shady kind of relationship you gave yourself unto us by the will of God let's go to number three consecration, faith, sanctification the consecration we are talking about is leading us somewhere it's leading us to so give our life so that the Lord will know that we really mean business in wanting to worship him, in wanting to serve him, and then he will sanctify. Not only that he's going to sanctify you because of consecration, it's going to make you useful. And it is the consecrated people that are going to have impact on their communities. They are the people that can really make a change. They can make the difference in their communities. This kind of consecration is the one that is always telling the Lord, like Jesus told the Lord in Gethsemane. In Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Verses 41 and 42. And he was withdrawn from them about 
his toes cast and he kneeled down and prayed saying father if thou will if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done not my will not my will the problem with many christians is that they have not come to that level where they will say in everything everything in your life not my will but thine be done that will give you patience that will give you humility that will make you to moderate all your desires and say well i have this desire but i'm not going to fight for it i'm not going to say i must have it by all means because not my will but thine be done it will mean submission in your life it will mean well if i were left alone by myself this is what i would have done this is the kind of place i would have wanted to sleep this is the kind of food i would have liked to eat this is the kind of way i would have liked to dress as a growing adolescent i would have wanted to go this way and go this way this is the kind of music i would have enjoyed if i were left to myself this is the kind of choice i would have made but oh lord here is my consecration not my will not my ambition not my desires not what is convenient for me not my will but thine be done that's the consecration we're talking about and it is that kind of consecration that makes the lord to now come in with his mighty sanctifying power to sanctify you. ezekiel chapter 36 ezekiel chapter 36 from verse 25 then will i sprinkle water upon you and ye shall be clean and from your filthiness and from all your idols will i cleanse you that's salvation and a new heart also will i give you and a new spirit will i put within you a new heart examine yourself there are many of us that give testimonies of sanctification and will say oh praise the lord i got sanctified really don't just say it, examine it. You have the new heart, the new spirit, the new disposition, the new attitude, the new desires, and the new panting longing after God. It says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of of your flesh take away the stony heart out of your flesh it's so very difficult to maintain a christian group or a christian body on some campuses and the reason is because there are young people that claim to be following god that want to have their way and they want to have things done the way they want you, you have about maybe uh, five six people maybe in the executive you have somebody for the bible study for prayers for publicity for uh, coordinating the whole thing and they will spend two three hours talking on something they should have decided in only five minutes you know the reason why this one wants what is saying to be the final the other one wants what she's saying to be the final and they argue and argue and argue where is the new spirit where is the new heart where is the unity where is the humility where the, where is the disposition that puts the other brother first that puts the other sister first where is the experience of sanctification in the midst of such uh, a group of students a new heart and a new spirit will i give you i will take away the stony heart the rebellious heart and this uh, the stiff neck i will take that away from you and i will give you an heart of flesh that is so salt that is so considerate that is so tender that is teachable and that is humble well will god just do this for us automatically look at verse 36 the latter part of verse 36 says i the lord have spoken it and i will do it verse 37 thus says the lord god i will yet for this be inquired of by the house of israel to do it for them i will increase them with men like a flock it says if the lord is going to do it then the lord will require 
that you ask him that you pray and that you really pray you really want it but when you pray you'll have to manifest faith in acts chapter 15 acts chapter 15 verse 9 and put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith purifying their hearts by faith i want to remind you of the definition that our brother who preached yesterday morning i gave on faith forsaking all i trust him and now you come to the point where you want to be sanctified and you have been full of self before you have been full of my way my will my desires my opinion my ideas my unbending principle everything my 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 now forsaking all that i trust him it is when you lay everything on the altar and the things that were so interesting to you before you say lord enough is enough i now want to serve you i now want to yield everything to you and i forsake all these things that have been standing between me and you forsaking all the bad things of course i forsake the ugly adamic nature in me that will not allow me to submit will not allow me to be teachable will not allow me to listen will is spoiling my christian life it's not allowing me to go the direction how to go it's not allowing me to be fully dedicated and yielded and devoted and surrendered and submissive unto you all those things standing between me and absolute yieldedness unto you i forsake forsaking all i trust him it is in that place of leaning on him trusting him believing him saying i believe you can do it with you all things are possible you can take away this stony heart this adamic nature you can circumcise my very nature and i trust you to do it and when you fully trust him to do it by that kind of faith then he does it when he does it you'll find that there is purity within you'll find there is holiness within well there had been holiness when you were born again externally partially moderately but now when you are really sanctified there will be that purity that holiness inward and all encompassing kind of holiness there will be this pure love unfeigned love and perfect love in your heart that people will even be able to say something happened to sister so and so something happened to brother so and so because things are now totally different not only that it also means that you are going to be in unity with the people of god that anytime we are discussing you'll not be getting so disturbed when people don't take your suggestion uh, you know sometimes it's difficult to discuss with some so-called christians if they suggested anything and you said well brother we understand sister we understand but uh, it appears that this is a better thing to do they become so gloomy they become so unhappy it's like you have uh, not respected them you are not accepting them as part of the people you say well i am not needed in that place any suggestion i give they, they never even consider it at all you are not going to be feeling offended whenever those things are not taken when you are really sanctified you say praise the lord my brother is uh, wiser than i am and that's why they have taken a suggestion praise the lord my sister reasoned about that thing very well and the suggestion is better than mine that is why they have taken what she has said when you are really sanctified things will totally change your life before we pray exodus chapter 21 exodus chapter 21 verses 5 and 6 and if the servant shall plainly say i love my master my wife and my children i will not go out free then his master shall bring him unto the judges he shall also bring him unto the door or unto the uh, doorpost and his master shall bore his ears through with an awl and he shall serve him forever here we have a hebrew slave that had the opportunity to do as he pleased 
to go free. To now be released in the year of release. And then the servant, the slave, will say, Yes, I know the inconveniences of this kind of life. To be uh, a servant, to be a slave, I know the conditions. I know what I've gone through, but I love my Lord. I love my master so much that I do not even want to go free. I do not want to go and do my will. I do not want to have the conveniences that other people are having. I do not want to go into the free world. The free world of the people that are disciplined. The free world of the people that will eat whatever they want, dress the way they want, and do whatever kind of thing they want to do. I want to be under the control of my master forever. They say, you really mean it? Oh, and he says, yes, I mean it. If you mean it, it is going to make a mark on you. So that all the other servants that have accepted their release and they have gone out, there is something that will make a difference between you and them. And he says, yes, I'm willing to bear that mark. Remember, everybody that sees you outside will see this mark on you and they will know that you are a slave. And that you are a servant and you are a slave forever. There is no way to be free again. This mark is going to make you a perpetual. He says, yes, I know the consequence of my decision. Then they bring the judges for witness. And then they bring him near the doorpost. And you remember that at such time, there was nothing. They were used to dead in the pain. And this man was already an adult. A married man with children. And then they will use a sharp needle. And then pierce the ear. So that he can bear that pain and that mark and then he'll say yes i rejoice in taking that the question i have for you today is are we willing to be so subservient submissive yielded surrendered to the lord jesus christ who died for us on the cross of calvary that we go to the cross today and we say lord nail me on it crucify me too I'm willing to take anything it is. And I'm willing for you to even do anything that will make a permanent mark on me. That all the other Christians that see me on the campuses will say, you went somewhere. Something happened to you. You can't talk the way you used to talk. You can't eat what you used to eat. The liberty that you had before, you don't have that liberty again. It looks like now your life is under a special control. Are we willing to really go before the Lord and say, Lord, whatever it will mean, whatever the implication, I want to consecrate everything that I have unto the Lord. Let's rise up and let's really commit ourselves to the Lord. Make it personal. Make it an individual matter. Are you born again? Or are you just uh, thinking that you can offer some things to the Lord that are like dead sacrifices? If you have not been born again, yield yourself to the Lord to be born again. If you have been born again, then you really need to consecrate. Members of your body, you need to consecrate to the Lord. Your future, your present, your ambition, your skill, everything that you have. In the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The labor of all church workers shall never be in vain. As our Father, the Father of all globally, the Covenant of GCK, Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumui gives us the Global Church Workers Conference live from Taraba State, Nigeria. All church workers and ministers globally to join hands with all ministers across Taraba State, Northern Nigeria from 17 to 20 November 2022. It's our time for triumphing in ministry, even in troublous times. Pastor Dr. W. F. Kumuyi will be ministering 8 a.m. daily from Jalingo, Taraba State, to the world via satellites and on all our social media platforms. It will be an avalanche of global expositions and revelations. Your labor will not be in vain. When we started the year 2022, you had hopes, you had desires, you had dreams, but suddenly, all over the globe, we read and hear of failures economically.
politically with climate change and security regions here and there. And now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Now, I hear a voice echoing towards the northeastern geopolitical zone of Nigeria. Today, the Lord is saying, weep not. All your tears are dried because behold the lion of the tribe of judah the roots of david has prevailed and it's confirmed that there's still one hope one way one solution and one power that never fails the power of jesus christ reverberates this november with gck live from adamawa state nigeria the land of beauty set to beautify your life through christ as the covena of gck pastor dr w f kumuyi will touch down in adamawa nigeria with a power that never fails healing deliverance salvation november 24 to 29 2022 1600 hours gmt daily and 0700 hours gmt for sunday worship service young people from all levels will be empowered for excellence at the impact academy on november 26 2022 at 0600 hours gmt ministers and professionals will be empowered for breakthrough in ministry on november 25 26 28 and 29 at 0600 hours gmt our guest gospel minister is bob feats this is an avalanche of manifestation of the power that never fails for all life. Power will herald your celebration. Dr. William Kumui says, Be it confirmed in your life in Jesus' name. GCK, the gospel to every creature.